Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 177th Landon Lecture on Public Affairs. This series was instituted in 1966 by former K-State President James A. McCain. And of course, our goal in Landon Lectures is to bring the most prominent thought leaders to Kansas State University to discuss the pressing issues of the day. We are very pleased to welcome Her Excellency Dr. Joyce Bonda to the Landon Podium to join 176 predecessors in bringing their thoughts and opinions on important public issues. This time I'd like to make a few introductions. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, April Mason, uh, our provost here at Kansas State University. <laughs> Dr. Jackie Hartman, chairperson of the Landon Lecture Series and chief of staff in the Office of the President. Dr. Barry Flinchball, Chair of the Landon Patrons. <laughs> Carrie Fink, President, University Support Senate. There you are, Carrie. <laughs> Jack Ayers, uh, Kansas State Student Body President and a Senior in Chemical Engineering. And, and just admitted to the Kansas University Medical School. where he says he's gonna wear purple all the time, no matter what the grades are. I promise and, and, and Olivia Ballman, K-State student body vice president and senior in computer science. And we have one very special guest I'd like to introduce, and that's Senator Nancy Kassenbaum Baker. And I know you're back up that way. She's right behind the... <clears throat> Dr. Joyce Banda served as president of Malawi in 2012 and through 2014. She was credited with turning around the nation's ailing economy. Under economic reforms that she instituted, Malawi's rate of economic growth rose from 1.8% to 6.2% in 2014. She also repealed a number of laws which had weakened democratic institutions, infringed on civil liberties and restricted freedom of the press. The health of women and children was a major priority during her presidency, and she established a presidential initiative on Malawi health and safe motherhood, which helped drop the maternal mortality, mortality rate in Malawi. Before becoming president of Malawi, Dr. Bonda served as the nation's vice president, foreign minister, minister of gender, gender and child welfare, and as a member of parliament. As a minister of gender and child welfare, she championed the enactment of the Prevention of Domestic Violence Bill in 2006, which provided the legal framework to support the prevention and elimination of all forms of violence against women and girls. Since leaving office, Dr. Bonda serves on the board of Nutrition International Canada and the Tana High Level Forum of Peace and Security in Africa. She is a member of the Council of Women, World Leaders, and, distinguished, and a distinguished fellow with the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and the Center for Global Development. As a founder of the Joyce Bonda Foundation, she continues her work with the, inter, with the um, Joint, Joint Bonda Foundation International. She continues her work with the foundation to transform villages in Malawi by supporting women's economic empowerment, education, maternal health, HIV AIDS programs, leadership training, and human rights. She also serves as a panelist and motivational speaker at international conferences and forums. Dr. Bonda's work has drawn many honors. She was named one of the most powerful black women in Africa in Forbes magazine in both 2013 and 14, one of the most influential people in the world by Time and Forbes, and one of the most inspirational women in politics by CNN. Her degrees include the bachelor's in gender studies from Atlantic University and a master's in leadership from the Royal Roads University of Canada. Uh, just a little personal aside, we first met, I think it was in 2012 in South Africa, and um, there are two terms I would use to describe Joyce Bonda, and uh, the two terms are both the same, they're courage. Uh, the courage to be in politics when your life is threatened, and she's had attempts on her life. That's what, when we, our first discussion, that first got my attention, uh, that uh, as a grandmother, she said, 
the country's more important than my personal safety. That's real courage. And then once in office as president, uh, she had the courage to do uh, the right things, even though she knew it would be unpopular among some. And uh, I think she made a real difference. So please help me welcome to this stage uh, Her Excellency President Bonda to Kansas State University. Thank you very much, President General Myers, for those kind remarks. It is an honor for me to be here today to deliver the first London Lecture of, 19, of 2018. And I think the first London Lecture ever to be delivered by an African woman. I'd like to thank President General Richard Myers Dr. Jackie Hartman, and Dr. Barry Flinchball for inviting me. I was speaking to my nephew yesterday who came here, and I said, why should this place be called Manhattan, Kansas? I got confused, I thought I was going to New York. He says, no, but we are proud as alumni to call it my happiness and the little apple. <laughs> I have titled my lecture, America's Role in Promoting Gender Equality and Development Worldwide, Lessons from Africa. My goal is to ensure that when all of you listening today leaves this auditorium, you will see that it is our collective task to promote gender equality and development around the world. I've been fortunate that all the things I have championed in my life have come from personal experience. Things happened to me and I took action in every capacity that I had. Today, I have the distinct honor to share some of these experiences with you an audience of scholars and future world leaders from this great country. I will also highlight the role America has played in my development as a woman leader and the development of my country and my continent. Each one of us has our own story that shapes us and it is our individual responsibility to contribute to the common good and positively impact the world worldwide. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, you might be asking, but who is she? I know that General Myers has tried to introduce me, but let me give you a little bit about my background and what am I talking about? What is it that shaped me? What is it that drew my attention to the global status of human beings. I was born in a little village in Malawi, and the tradition that I was born in is what they call the matrilineal system of marriage, where the husband will come and live in the wife's village. And so your father has very little control on how you are raised. Your grandmother is supposed to give you her name at birth if you are the eldest granddaughter and she is supposed to bring you up and prepare you for motherhood as a wife, but also as a matriarch, because when she dies, you become the matriarch of the family. The example is that my daughter, who is sitting here, is called Edith, and Edith was my mother's name. So when my mother died, she's the head of the family, even I call her mom. <laughs> that is the tradition. In my particular case, I was born in this little village. A British nurse had come to establish a clinic. So I was one of those first children born in this little clinic. My grandmother was holding me when the doctor came around the following day. Asked my grandmother what my name was going to be. Instead of saying, well, my tradition, 
demands that I shall name her my name. She asked whoever was translating to say, ask her what her name is. And this woman said, I'm Joyce. She says, well, then that's going to be the name of this child. She said, she told me later that she did that because she straight away saw that woman as my role model. She saw that I was going to grow up one day and establish clinics and build hospitals and, and care for the poor. Well, I've ended up building 15 clinics, but she denied me my right to inherit the matriarchy of the family. <laughs> the second was that she was supposed to bring me up. My father insisted that he wanted to bring me up and send me to school. He had just, just joined the Malay police band, so we, he lived 15 kilometers away. They argued and argued in the end they compromised. They agreed that five days of the week I would stay in town and go to school and then weekends I would go home and spend time with my grandmother. Every Friday after school I jumped on the bus to go to Domasi where my grandmother lived and without fail when I got down from the bus by the roadside a friend of mine by the name of Chrissy would be waiting for me and we would walk together into the village and she taught me all about village life. And I taught her all that I was experiencing in town. I went to the urban school. She went to the village school. She was brighter than me. I know she was brighter than me because she was first position every class. We went to the end of primary school. We were both selected to the best girls school, secondary schools in Malawi. I went to Saint Mary, she went to St. Mary's, I went to Providence Secondary School. I came back the next holiday, Chrissy was not by the roadside. I asked my grandmother what had happened. Chrissy wasn't there waiting for me. My grandmother said, I don't think she wants to see you. Chrissy dropped out of school. Her family could not afford the six dollars she required to go back to school. I was 14 years old when I was awakened to this kind of injustice. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as I'm talking to you now, 130 million girls are not in school through no fault of their own. Sometimes they tell us 40 million. Sometimes, sometimes they tell us 100 million. But, but isn't it tragic that we are sitting here, you and I, and the, a hundreds of girls are out of school through no fault of their own. I made up my mind at that age that I was going to grow up and send as many girls as possible to school because when I asked my father to send Chrissy to school to find six dollars, my father said my salary is six, eighteen dollars, so when the three of you go, I have no change. So Chrissy dropped out. And as I'm talking to you now, Chrissy is where I left her. And I went on and, I, and on and ended up in State House as head of state. Is that fair? It was too late for me to send Chrissy to school, but I've ensured that all her children go to college. And as I'm talking to you now, Chrissy is in the village, but she's a fellow champion as me, because in 2013, I brought Chrissy to New York to attend the UN General Assembly side meetings. And she made Gordon Brown the UN envoy for education. And I told her that you lost out, but you can become a champion just like me. So the schools that I have built in Malawi in the village, Chris is the champion that goes about looking for girls, need the girls to go to school. At age 34, I went to give birth to my fourth born child and suffered what they call postpartum hemorrhage. I was bleeding to death. That is the main cause of death for pregnant women in my country, especially those that don't end up in hospital, especially those that just end up giving birth at the uh, traditional birth attendant. My husband knew one of the only three uh, gynecologists, went and brought him and saved my life, and I woke up, and I started to look around. At that point, 1,200 women were dying giving birth. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is not acceptable that a woman should die giving life. Why is it that here in Kansas, when a woman is pregnant, 
Straight away you go and register, start buying stuff and paint a room pink or blue. You even know the sex of the child. Why is it that in this same world, where I come from, it's a time of anxiety because you don't know whether when you go, you're going to come back. So maternal health, I decided that as long as I live, I shall fight this unnecessary death. I'm just so proud that when I became president, the first thing I did was to meet chiefs and form a, a, a national network of traditional leaders because they are the custodians of tradition and culture and ensured that they sensitize their communities, they make their own bylaws, and encourage all women to deliver at a hospital. In the time I was president, we were able to build 20 holding shelters so that they can walk to the clinic and stay there and wait for labor. And in the time I was head of state, I encouraged the private sector to build holding shelters and we were able to reduce maternal death from 675 to, to 460 per 100,000 life births in 24 months. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, by age 21 I was married. By age 25 I had three children. And I stayed 10 years in an abusive marriage. I cannot even begin discussing the fights, the physical fights, the abuse. 10 years later, I packed my bags. At a time when people didn't divorce, you didn't walk away from abusive relationships. But I said I was doing it for my, my, my children. My mother even faked a heart attack. My friends are laughing at me. What kind of a daughter do you have who walks away from a marriage? What is it that she can't stand and tolerate? I made up my mind at that point that I would never stand by and watch a fellow woman be abused if I can help it. Why must women be abused? One out of every five women is abused. I can write a book and I'm just so proud that when I became Minister of Women and Children in 2004, the first was for me to look for a bill that had already been drafted by the civil society and take it to parliament. And the, 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 the lobbying and the fights and the abuse in making sure that championing that bill to pass is another book and another lecture. Suffice to say, I'm so proud that in 2006, we passed the domestic violence bill in Malawi. The fourth area that I have championed, these are the four pillars of the Joyce Banner Foundation. So I believe that women can avoid gender-based violence, can avoid abuse if they're economically empowered. I believe that women at grassroots, when they begin to contribute income into the poor household, they earn respect at household level. They begin to to participate in the decision making of the household, but also to make decisions about their own lives. An aunt, an African woman who didn't go to school, but has income, will ensure that her girl child goes to school so that the vicious cycle of poverty ends with her. This extraordinary journey of mine could not have been possible without the support of the American government. I'm sure some of you were saying, is she not lost? She's telling us about herself. Where is the, the American role? By the end of this lecture, you will see what America can do overseas. It is important for me to give this lecture at this time. And I'll tell you why. But first, let me talk about the fact that America has always play, played a, a very important role in Africa. The former Assistant Secretary of State, Wendy Sherman, just this past week on MSNB, MSNBC, said that uh, the majority of Africans love America and look up to America for leadership. Only many global issues such as human rights, governance, 
and indeed climate change, and so on, and so on. This is why I must cite what we as Africans most remember about past governments of this great nation. One of the most celebrated presidents, American presidents in Africa, is President George W. Bush. His president's emergency plan for aid relief, acronymed PEPFA, has provided ARV treatment to over 7.7 .7 million uh, HIV-infected people in resource-limited settings and supported HIV testing and counseling for more than 56.7 million people. Furthermore, he finalized and signed the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, AGOA, in May of 2000, to increase opportunities for trade between the United States and Africa. He started the United States Africa Command to strengthen American security cooperation helped develop African military and democratic capacities and to promote peace and security globally. President Bush visited Africa 10 times, more than any other president in history. I spent many years waiting for an opportunity to meet him and to thank him. And I was privileged to meet him in 2014 at a, an event that was organized in New York to honor us, and I thanked him. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, President Obama built on some of the work done by President Bush, including extending their Goa legislation, showing that both Democrats and Republicans value building trade with Africa and facilitating good relationships. President Obama built on this by focusing on African leaders and always made sure we were concerted on his initiatives. During my presidency, I was invited to the White House alongside three other African presidents to discuss presidential achievements and propose ways to accelerate implementation of US-supported projects in our countries, such as the Millennium Challenge Account, AGOA, PEPFA, and others. Furthermore, President Obama hosted the US-Africa Summit in August of 2014, bringing together over 50 African dignitaries to discuss trade and cooperation. He also started the Young African Leaders Initiative, finding the top talent from the continent and giving them training and internship here in the United States of America to support their development as leaders. I'd also like to mention, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, that many of your former presidents have made major impact on the continent of Africa. For example, President Jimmy Carter continued to observe elections, train local leaders, uh, mediate global conflicts, and promote human rights. And isn't it wonderful that at the age of 94, after beating cancer, he continues to build houses for disadvantaged communities. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, President Bill Clinton, through his foundation, has done commendable work throughout the developing world to improve lives. In my country, he has done a lot of work in the health sector such as providing equipment to hospitals for AIDS patients, promoting maternal health, and even building a full-fledged hospital in the Neno district of Malawi. When President Clinton came to Malawi to start work, we had to sign an agreement. And I was then foreign minister. And my president said, well, since he's no, he is no longer president, you are going to host him. So I remember meeting him at the airport, and then we traveled into State House. After the event of the signing event, I had to see him off. He left the same day. And I shall never forget this. I go to the airport, and anybody who knows me, all my adult life, I've dressed up like this. I'm an African woman first. So I get to the airport and find he's very popular in Malawi. 
So thousands and thousands of people had gotten to the airport to see him off. So women dressed like me were dancing there. So what I do when I find rural women dancing, I danced as well. <laughs> so I joined in the dancing. And these people, the Secret Service people, were there waiting for President Bill Clinton to arrive. And then I'm dancing and they saw me and they didn't know who I am. So when I heard the siren, President Bill Clinton arriving, I stepped forward to receive him and he grabbed my throat. He must have thought I'm some suicide bomber or something. <laughs> and I said to him, don't touch me, leave me. He says, who are you? I said, so in that moment, I needed to tell him something he could understand. I said, I'm Condoleezza Rice. <laughs> <laughs> My husband told me later that to say that was a stupid joke. You don't look anything like Condoleezza Rice, and he could have shot you. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, American private citizens who have never been presidents have also made significant impact in Africa. People like the late Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and Ambassador Andrew Young in the 60s were civil rights activists here in the United States, but lobbied for African freedom by denouncing colonialism and encouraging our independence. Dr. Martin Luther King was even present with the Dr. Kwame Nkrumah in 1957 in Ghana when they received their independence, the first of its kind in Africa. It was a personal milestone for me to receive the Dr. Martin Luther King drum major Award for Freedom in 2012 for quality leadership and as a fighter for freedom. There's a little girl aged 15 in New York State. When she was seven years old, she was involved in an accident coming back from school. She was being driven by her nanny. And when they took her to the hospital, there was no room in the children's ward, so she ended up in the corridor. When she left that hospital, she went and told her father, uh, help me to raise funds to extend that clinic. She was eight. There's a picture at nine years old, her cutting the ribbon, opening that wing. As I'm talking to you now, she's the president of the young the Children's Committee on Security at the United Nations. The following years, three following years after that clinic, opening of that clinic, she started going to companies and mobilizing non-perishable foods and distributing to homeless women. This year, three years ago, I met her father. Her father handed her over to me to mentor her. And this American child now is distributing school uniforms to needed children in Africa, hundreds in Malawi. Because when a child has no uniform and in tatters, they don't go to school. So even where primary school is free, the child will not go to school when they have no clothes. At 15 years old, an American girl child decided she was going to make a difference. I'm talking about the role America can play, both at government and at individual level. There's a child by the name of Mongai who lives in South Carolina. She, her parents originally came from Africa. The mother took her to see Africa for the first time when she was seven. She saw children carrying books in plastic papers going to school. She didn't understand why they had no backpacks. Her mother said they can't afford their poor. She came back to this great nation and told her teacher and her class. And immediately they helped her raise 50 bucks. And she went back and gave those 50 bucks to her fellow children. As I'm talking to you now, this year she has distributed 10,000 bucks to 35 countries. And she's 13 years old. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we can do it. As African countries began to gain independence from their colonial rules, the United States government saw the opportunity to contribute to developing countries. 
And thus, the United States Agency for International Development was established in 1960. In the fiscal year 2015, the United States provided more than $8 billion in, uh, in assistance to 47 countries throughout the 33 regional and bilateral missions. USID provides partnerships on the continent and works to prevent conflict that creates political instability and not only adversely affects Africa, but also US national security. Presently, USID focuses on boosting agricultural productivity, improving health systems, supporting democracy and human rights, increasing resilience to climate shocks, and leading quick responses to humanitarian crises. The main victims of crisis on the continent of Africa are women and girls. In my country, Malawi, among other projects, USID has done a lot of work to mainstream equality. For example, USID launched a project called the Girls' Attainment in Basic Literacy and Education, the Gable Project, in 1992. Many women in leadership positions today in Malawi benefited from this initiative because girls were allowed to go to school free. It was during this same period that USID first recognized that we can only achieve gender equality if we change mindsets at the community level. This started their social mobilization work, and as such, the Creative Center for Community Mobilization, CRECOM, was born. USID continues to impact its impact today through the Feed the Future project and maternal health and safe motherhood initiatives. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me share with you what happens when the United States of America decides to invest in an African woman. Allow me to tell you a little bit about the pivotal role USID played on my leadership journey. When I sit down to write my memoir, the chapter on leadership shall start with the United States government. In 1987, I attended a meeting in Malawi by the United uh, Nations Development Program. The country director wanted us to discuss the private sector and why it was not growing as it should and why it was not being looked upon as the engine for growth in Malawi. This was during the, the, the dictatorship in Malawi. I was on one of only two women that were invited. At this meeting, there was a gentleman by the name of Don Henry, an American who was uh, heading an, a project by USID called the Red Project, the Rural Enterprise Development Project. And I stood up to speak. And I told UNDP and all attending that they were wasting time discussing the pri private sector as an engine for growth when women were being isolated when women were not being empowered, when women were not sitting at the table and when women were not participating in business. At break time, he com contacted me and told me he had never heard a Malawian woman speak like that before, handed me a card and said, if you ever need me in the future, just contact me. In 1989, I applied to come to the US to attend, to, 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 to attend the six-week exchange program. And during that study tour, I interacted with a lot of women uh, organizations. One of them that I remember vividly was the uh, National Association of Women Business Owners. At the end of that tour, I was very clear in my mind that I was going to go back home and uh, organize and, uh, uh, and start an organization to fight for equal opportunities in business. I was at that point just thinking about 100 women. So I went back home and looked for Don Henry and met Don Henry. And Don Henry told me, go and meet my boss. The country director of USID then was Carol Peasley. 
I went and met Carol. Ill prepared and I was so green, I didn't even know how to approach donors. I didn't know approach donors had a special language that you had to use in order to convince them. And I saw that in five minutes, Carol put her part down and I knew that I wasn't making sense. Because all I knew was that women in Malawi needed help and that I was ready. So I went back to Don Henry. I said, I didn't have much success with the Carol. And she, he asked me, what did I say? I told him, he says, yeah, you were ill-prepared. We donors, we want statistics. We want you to tell us the exact situation of women in Malawi and why they need support and why it must be you leading them. So I went back to Carol and asked for a needs assessment survey to be conducted and could they fund it. From that needs assessment survey, fast forward, USID supported us, and USID established in Malawi what they called the shared project. And the shared project was helping strengthen the civil society. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it's not easy to build, to strengthen civil society in the developing world, because most of the countries where we operate in the civil society, we are looked upon as the opposition. And we are harassed and we are abused. But when they know that USID is at the center of that is protection as well. In that period alone, when the shared project was uh, taking place in Malawi, 200 or so organizations were formed, including the National Association of Business Women that I established. And we all formed what we called the National Gender Coordinating Network. And I became the first chair, and it had 69 NGOs just looking at issues of gender and gender equality. USID sent me to Grameen Bank to spend time with Muhammad Yunus. And USID sent me to India to work with Elabat, Self-Employed Women's Association. When I came back, I established the National Association of Business Women and de de designed our own model for microfinance. By 1997, we had reached 50,000 women and provided microfinance to 20,000 women, all with the support of USID. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the organization that I founded by 1997 was the strongest rural network run by women across the country. I received the Africa Prize in 1997 and shared that with President Chisan of Mozambique. The prize money was $50,000. But what I had found during my work at grassroots with women empowering them economically was that in most villages where you went, brothers were not there. They were in town. They were teachers. They were doctors. Their sisters had not been sent to school because when resources were low, girls didn't go. And I decided that if I was ever going to continue to support women, I needed to focus on education for the girl child. So with the $50,000 that I received from the Hunger Project as prize money, I started the Joyce Panda Foundation. And I'm proud to report that working with champions like Chrisse and others and Edith, we have sent to school 6,500 girls. I went on. And in that organization of the National Association of Business Women, four of us ended up going to parliament and ended up being ministers of women and children, and on my, on my part, all the way to state house as head of state. I want to underline that to show the stubborn link between economic empowerment and leadership, and political leadership, because for us to compete where we come from, just like here, you need to have uh, economic resources in order to do it. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, where I come from, there are thousands of Joyce Banders. Working with Joyce Banda Foundation, National Association of Business Women, the total of all the men and women that we have supported and the children going to school, it's 1.3 million. So if there are thousands of Joyce Banders, just imagine if they all got the kind of support that USID provided to me what our continent would be like. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, so recently 
we have heard and read about your new policy of America first. Africans respect and accept this national, nationalistic policy. We need to respect that because that's the position of US, U, US, but also UK. It's America first, it's UK first. In my opinion, I look at this as an opportunity for us as Africans to get our priorities right. As you know, Africa is not poor. It is endowed with the huge natural resources and human resources. And in most of our countries, these resources, mineral wealth, are unexploited. African lead leaders now realize that and make policy, realize this potential and make policies to ensure that these resources benefit the people they lead. So while in some cases in the past these resources have been mismanaged, countries like Botswana, Ghana, Tanzania, and Rwanda are setting the pace in demonstrating that these natural resources can benefit their people. We have the largest youth population in the world, 200 million people to be precise. And it is high time that we make sure that those youth, particularly girls, have the opportunity to shine with or without the support of the United, Nation, the, the United States of America. Our mineral wealth can fund, educate, education, health, and food production on the continent and develop and our growing workforce. The progress we are making is encouraging. Some in this distinguished audience might not know that there are areas where Africa is doing better than the United States. According to the World Economic Forum, Ethiopia is the fastest growing economy in the world. This was announced this week. Djibouti makes to the top 10 list, as does Tanzania, which is growing at double the pace of the United States of America. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I believe it or not, the richest man that ever lived was an African. His name was Mansa Musa. He was from Mali. You can Google him. He had a net worth of the equivalent of 400 billion, four times the worth of Bill Gates. This worth mainly came from mineral wealth. I'm mentioning this because we, we all know how Bill Gates has impacted humanity and has done so much to touch lives. So if this Musa Mansa had done the same, Africa wouldn't be where we are. That's what I mean by saying we just need to put our priorities right. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is unfortunate that while the US is taking this nationalistic position and even exiting Paris Agreement, divesting from international markets and development, other countries such as Canada and China are seizing the opportunity, rushing in to fill the leadership vacuum, investing in infrastructure, hiring their people to work, and promoting trade and culture. The good news is that Africa is still a place in the world that respects democracy and looks up to the United States of America for leadership. But if America abdicates that position of leadership, your country's geopolitical power will be weakened. It is therefore imperative that America and Africa leaders, American and African leaders, forge partnerships, smart partnerships, that are based on mutual respect and dignity for each other. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the tragedy is that this nationalistic approach of the developed world, if it continues, I fear that we will divert from the path that we were on towards achieving the sustainable development goals, and in particular, achieving gender equality. All members of the United Nations agreed to unsigned this agenda in 2015. 
It was my hope that in partnership with the developed world, Africa would achieve the gender equality by, gender equality by 2030. Why is common sense not very common? <laughs> that if we ignore women who are more than half of the human race, our world's de development will be stunted. Isn't it true that we are more than men in number? And isn't it true that we brought the other half into this world? There's an obvious moral case in investing in women, as we are members of a society predicated upon the values of equality and justice for all. But we live in the real world, and we want to see returns in our investments. According to research done at Col Columbia University, there's a strong correlation between countries with female leaders uh, and the rise in GDP, 6.9 percent to be precise. The probability of violence ending in a country increases by 25 percent when women are well represented in the legislatures. And when women participate in peace processes, the resulting ag uh, agreement is 35 percent more likely to last. Furthermore, women are more likely to pass legislation that promotes education, health care, and social welfare improving overall health and productivity in the society. To build women leaders, it is critical to start by investing in the girl child. My research as the, as the Goodwill Ambassador, um, I mean, sorry, as, the, as, a, as a fellow, has revealed that leaders are born with 30% traits, but 70% are left to be developed throughout the person's life. In many parts of Africa, girls aged zero to 10 are discriminated against when it comes to accessing education, especially when they live in poverty. In many cases, they fall victim of harmful cultural practices. Facing these challenges, girls are less likely to develop the other 70% traits, leaving the 30% to waste. Decision makers must implement policies and build programs that protect and promote the girl child. It is my sincere hope that the US government will continue supporting in the immediate need for girls' education. Equally here in the United States, while there have been significant successes in terms of girls' equality and access to education, research shows that over the past 10 years, more and more girls, particularly from minority and immigrant backgrounds are living in poverty. This leads more girls to experience emotional and physical uh, health problems. They have, uh, as American girls grow into women, they face a whole new set of challenges. According to the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Report, the United States ranks 74th in wage equality among 145 countries at a rate of 64%, meaning that women in your country only make two-thirds of what men do. The United States, alongside Papua New Guinea, is one of the two countries that does not ensure paid maternity leave. Child care costs are extremely high, and women are much more likely to experience related career interruptions. Furthermore, sexual harassment complaints are now daily news terrorizing women both at school and in the workplace. To be quite honest, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, these statistics shock me. How can a country like the United States, one of the oldest democracies in the world, not offer maternity leave? While the United Kingdom women can go as long as nine months. How can the United States have such wage inequalities when countries like Iceland have passed laws to enforce equal pay. How come only 19% of American legislators are women after two centuries of democracy? And the biggest question I have is how can the United States of America 
be in a democracy for over 200 years and do not have elected a single female president. I don't understand. I don't get it. I don't get it because Africa has done well. We have had four female presidents. Liberia, Malawi, Central African Republic, and now Mauritius has a female president. So therefore, I believe that there's one or two things we can also teach America. <laughs> the world has seen more than 50 heads of state. However, even though we are making progress in putting women in leadership roles, particularly as heads of state, we have trouble keeping them there. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you what you already know. Women's leadership is under attack globally. In fact, some of the experiences and acts of abuse they face are horrific. Australia's former Prime Minister Julia Gillard faced consistent verbal abuse in Parliament and was driven out of office by her male counterparts. After she left, she was pursued on baseless corruption charges, only to be cleared later. In Thailand, the former Prime Minister Shina, Shina, Shina Watra decided to subsidize rice for the poor. The army took over government because that was, to them was a crime and blamed her for the major loss of revenue to the government. And then a trial was opened. She was arrested and she thought it was a joke. How can I ever be arrested? How can I be tried for trying to feed the poor? But she was shocked that just two months ago, her Minister of Trade and his deputy, who had implemented that program, were sentenced to 40 years in jail for that program, the subsidy of rice, and his deputy to 37 years. And she was going to be sentenced two weeks later, and she ran away and fled the country. But she was still sentenced in her, in her absence, so she can't go back. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, our challenges in Africa are even more serious. Even to stand for elected office, you are abused, you are beaten up, you are stripped, naked, you don't have financial resources. We have had the opportunity to be trained by NDI, an American institution that came to Africa to give us training when we were seeking elected office. My humble request has been, we want more of this, but we want it to be appropriate training. We must work together, forge smart partnerships to design proper training for women, for African women, because here you will train me to go and campaign and be assertive and look people in the face and give them my points and what I'm going to do. In Africa, it's the opposite. If I go to a chief and look him in the face, I won't be elected. So we need to have appropriate training according to where we come from. In my case, I was elected as vice president in 2009. What we are worried about is the physical abuse. And I'm so grateful to the American government because Secretary Madeleine Albright, as chair of NDI, has just launched at the UN what she calls um, not the cost campaign to fight abuses to women seeking political office or women in public office. I was elected vice president in 2009. The constitution is very clear that if you are elected with your president, if anything happens to him midway, you shall take over, you shall take oath immediately. In, 19, in 2012, April 5, the president died. It took 72 hours for them to just imagine Joyce Banda becoming president of any country. <laughs> the drama that took place those three days is another book and another lecture. <laughs> but the General Odiro, who was head of the Malawi Defense Force in Malawi, who was very well known to General Richard Myers, got international support 
and intervened, and I was able to take oath 72 hours later. As I'm speaking to you now, when I left office, he was arrested. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, five weeks before I became president, on April 5, uh, on March 5, we were in South Africa attending an, uh, an event at the Brainhurst Foundation, where I first met uh, General Myers and his dear wife. And there were military leaders at this event. I was invited to chair the post-conflict effects on women and girls in Africa. And General Odelo told me later that it was that network that he formed at Tswalu that supported him and gave him the courage to intervene in my case so that I could become president because they encouraged him to do the right thing, to respect the constitution and to allow me to take oath. My motto has always been as a leader that leadership, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, is a love affair. You must fall in love with the people you serve and the people must fall in love with you. In 2012, when I became president, the country had grown by only 1.8%, as, as, as General Meyer said. Two, mili two million people were food insecure. The greatest lesson that I learned as president, and maybe that's what is different between women and male, male leaders, is that you engage the people. You must talk to the people. You must let them know, no matter how bad the situation is, because that's the way they will stand and side with you. I had to uh, uh, devalue the currency by 47%, which would have meant hardships for the people. I got into office and they told me I had a whole plane to me to travel in. I went in the plane, it was like a, a lounge. When two million people don't have food, I said, sell all the plane, <laughs> sell it. I went into state house and was told that he, everything was free, including food. I said, then why am I being paid? So I asked that 30% of my salary should be deducted and donated to an institution training people with disabilities. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, but it's hard where we come from to fight corruption. But that's one thing that I thought I should do. If you fall in love with the people and the people fall in love with you, you are not going to allow anybody to exploit them. But what I didn't know is how difficult it is. Because sometimes you think African leaders don't want to fight corruption. It backfires on you big time. Because the people that you are fighting are very strong people and with a lot of money and resources. So they'll fight you back. And I was warned. You have elections around the corner. You want to fight corruption? You want to arrest people? You will never win the next election. For me, that was not a big deal. I told my husband, if I have to vacate state house because I'm fighting corruption, let it be. There's life beyond state house. Look at me today. I'm in Kansas. Am I a president? But life goes on. I will forever be grateful to the European Union ambassador by the name of Alexander Baum. He's the one who alerted me that to check the integrated financial management system is being abused. And I checked. And I made an announcement to the nation and set up and put together a team. One week later, the first group was arrested. 72 people finally were arrested. I asked the British government to give me resources to conduct a forensic audit. Some people have said I was the first president in Africa to conduct a forensic audit in my government during my time. <laughs> but I, I thank God I did. And it's not because I'm too bright, but I was advised by a friend who was working at the World Bank. She told me, have a document that will exonerate you. You might need it in the future. And distinguished ladies and gentlemen, if I, had, if I didn't have that report, I would be in jail by now. Because they'll keep fighting you, 
And then you don't have anything to protect you. And I came here to uh, do my research. After that, I was going home. I reached South Africa. I phoned Malawi to tell them I was returning. And they made an announcement that there will be an arrest warrant for you if you return. Because this is an election year again. And everybody is saying, come back and stand again. You can't be living in the dark like this. Thank God, those of you who are following the news, it's just last week when the Anti-Corruption Bureau of Malawi issued a statement to say Joyce Banda is not connected to the corruption that took place. I should be out of my mind to be, take the lead to arrest people when I know I'm involved. I must be a fool. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm thankful, but what I've done, I've started taking defamation cases to court, and I'm also pleased to inform you that I've just won the first case. I say this because the, that is what women are facing on daily basis. I have had two assassination attempts, as General Meyer said. One of them, I was a whole head of state. I went in this area to switch on electricity at a clinic where we had installed this electricity. And people are coming, this man is charging towards me with a machete to come and hack me. And my policeman came in front and was hacked to death before me. I'm not the only one. People are going through this all over. I remember when Benazir Bhutto decided to go home, we all said she shouldn't go. But she went. And the day she arrived, 200 people were slaughtered. And then a few weeks later, she was killed herself. So we operate in those kind of hostile environments. Sometimes, that's where the United States government can step in. Because I'm telling you, I know what I'm talking about. There were many times when I could have been arrested, but sometimes I even just walked to the USID office and sat there and that was it. It's like, you can, can, can't get me because <laughs> well, they can't come near any USID office. So this is an area that I'm grateful that uh, Secretary Madeleine Albright is championing. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, against all odds, by the time I left office, the economy had grown by 6.2%, as General Meyer said earlier. When we left office, we had harvested 3.9 million metric tons of maize with 1 million overproduction. In a country where when I went in, 1 million people, 2 million people had no food. By the time I left office, press freedom had, we had, we, we, we had, I had opened up and allowed Malawians to be free to speak, to associate, to write. We moved from position 145 on the global index, index for press freedom to 79. When I came in, by the time I left, I had taken a bill to parliament on access declaration. I believe that when we get into office, we must declare what we have. And when we leave office, we must also declare what we have. And if it, you have too much, then you must explain how you got all that. <laughs> it's just common sense. We must also ask the global community to fight with us. Because now from the Panama Papers, we know that corruption is global. It's a global problem, so we must all work together. So if I'm a former president and I come into America and I buy five, six houses, you must ask me where I got the money from. That way you are not enablers, because we, sometimes we worry. I spent all my time in State House trying to get our money back that had been stuck in banks overseas. You find that sometimes there's reluctance for these countries to bring back the money for developing our nations. Well, that's where the money belongs. But sometimes it's not easy. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I want to recommend. I have listened to President Trump. He's a businessman, and he wants to promote trade. And I'm excited, because what Africa needs is not aid, but it's trade. I say this, not saying don't, don't support, don't give aid, 
But if we want to make an inter impact, we must create sustainable employment opportunities for the 50% of unemployed college graduates across Africa. So that will not be, uh, so that they will not be compelled to swim the Mediterranean to go looking for opportunities in Europe. Number two, Africa needs targeted aid money. Considering the American First Administration, we must make sure those dollars are going to the most impactful programs. AID must be gender sensitive to address the long-standing discrimination that has hindered girls and women. AID must help women to catch up, to catch up, because we are far behind. AID should focus on governance and institutional capacity building and sharing best practices. Local, national, and international decision makers should focus on promoting women leadership globally by putting these issues on the agenda and drafting legislation to protect them. Taking advice from countries like Iceland who just made wage inequality illegal, decision makers need to make sure that all environments, even campuses like Kansas State University, are conducive to the growth of women. Number three, Africa needs smart partnership. Not helicopter projects led by those who do not even understand us. We welcome your input and collaboration, but Africa must own the initiatives. I never went to school at Kansas. I never faced the struggles the average Kansas uh, woman has faced. So while I might have important insights into promote, promoting women's leadership globally, I would have a hard time building a solution to tackle all the intricate issues you might face if I don't work with you here. I am just advocating for smart partnership. We get heartbroken sometimes when we see international NGOs come to Africa and hope they can solve our problems without involving us. Remember that Africa has 54 countries, each with different legal, linguistic, and the cultural landscapes. And the only ones who will make projects sustainable are those who have grown up, been educated, and have their life roots there. Fortunately, these partnerships will be mutually beneficial as the United States and the African Union share many of the same values of democracy human rights, liberty, and justice for all. And remember, Africa and America will yield more if women are at the center of these initiatives. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to conclude. As I conclude, I must draw your attention to the fact that Africa is taking the lead in women's participation in leadership. Rwanda is the number one country ranked in terms of women's representation in parliament. While America is 18 or 19 percent women represented there, Africa, Rwanda in Africa is 64 percent. Africa has seen four female presidents. I know many countries who have failed to elect a single woman. Receiving an award at the Golden Globe, Oprah reminded us that it is a new age for women. We are no longer keeping quiet when injustices happen to us. And we are finally banding together in solidarity to support and promote one another. American women are leading this charge in Hollywood and across the nation. And the choices you make domestically have a multiplier effect on the rest of the world. I've seen American, women's rise, American women rise up and shout loudly about their opinions, making sure that their congressmen and senators hear their voice and represent them appropriately. In Africa, as feminists, we would do, take a different approach. Notably, UN Women and African Union, with the support of the German government, have just facilitated this a few months ago, the formation of the African Women Leaders Network a perfect partner for future American support of African women-led initiatives. 
This is your country and your world. If you see injustice or, or policies that you don't agree with, find your voice. Use your struggles and successes to organize, take action, and create impact. At the, at the end of the day, what matters to me is the freedoms and change we bring about in our own context and worldwide. I would like to end by paying special tribute to President General Richard Myers. I was, uh, I was invited to Tualu to chair the post-conflict girls, uh, post-conflict effect on women and girls. And while I was there, I, I met many generals, including General Richard Myers, General David Richards of UK, and a lot of generals from Africa. In fact, I was refusing to go and attend this meeting. There were too many military people <laughs> invited on the list. But my husband persuaded me to go, and I went. And I met General Richard Myers for the first time. And we interacted for the, those, that whole weekend. And I left South Africa on the 5th of March, 2012. Exactly four weeks later to the day, President Bingwa Mutarika died. I am told, I did know then, that 48 hours, they were pressurizing the army commander to take over government, kill me or do whatever, and hand over government to them, to the people that were in government, to the people that couldn't even imagine a woman taking over as head of state. I was also told later that it was that network that he had built at Tswalu, General Myers included, that gave him the support and the encouragement to, to do what was right at the moment. Follow the Constitution. Don't allow anybody to confuse you. We shall stand by you. On the third day, while they had already withdrawn all the security from my house, and they had already appointed another president, I phoned the army commander in my country, because I had met him at Tswalu with him. And I said, you must come here. He says, I'm on my way. I said, no, yesterday I called you. You didn't come. He said, today you don't need to persuade me. I'm on my way. I didn't know he had been convinced by his network that it was OK to do the right thing. And he came. And on the 7th of April, after 72 hours, I was allowed to take oath and become the president of Malawi. Just like President George W. Bush, uh, w. Bush, I've waited a long time to have an opportunity to thank General Myers. And this is a perfect opportunity. And I want him to know, and I want you to know, you and your wife, that I shall forever be grateful to you. For those who don't know, General Richard Myers has been very active on the continent through the Brainhurst Foundation that invites thinkers once a year to discuss issues affecting Africa. And he has been somebody who has been invited there again and again, and participated in bringing about peace and settling conflicts on the continent of Africa and good governance and human rights. But in addition to that, when I became president, I went back to Brenner's Foundation to seek for support to bring together Malawians to discuss our situation that I had found. There wasn't even fuel for a day. The fuel to take me to the president's funeral was donated by the president of Zambia. The Brenhurst Foundation provided the resources for me to bring the nation of Malawi together to discuss our economic recovery plan. General Myers, from there onwards, throughout the period I was head of state, he was on the advisory council for Joyce Band. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it's difficult for me to do this without being emotional, but allow me to end with a, a two-minute African story that my grandmother taught me 
when I was nine years old. There was an animal kingdom. And a lot of animals flourished and lived there in harmony. But there was severe famine one year. And thousands of animals were dying. And the few that remained were flocking together looking for whatever food they could find. And the giraffe with its long neck said to King Elephant, I see smoke ahead of us. Somebody is cooking food. And King Elephant said, but that's not possible. There's no food in the, in the jungle. And they flocked together and increased their pace and got to the place and indeed found little hare with a big pot on the fire and whatever it is he was cooking was boiling furiously. And he was, there were a few animals sitting around, passing on firewood to little hair so the fire could keep burning. And then they kept passing the firewood. And King Elephant said to little hair, so while all of us are starving, you are here busy cooking food. He said, your majesty, I'm not cooking food. I'm boiling stones. I'm boiling stones because I believe that if I keep boiling them, they will turn into pumpkins. And all the animals that came with King Elephant started walking away. As these ones sitting around were still busy passing on fire, would so little hair could keep the fire burning. And they were walking away and calling him all kinds of names. And little hair shouted behind them and said, Your Majesty. At least I'm doing something about the situation. I want to thank General Myers for the fire would you keep passing on so that I can keep this fire burning. Because you know what? One day these stones will turn into pumpkins. May God bless you. I was told by some that we don't have any time for questions. We're going to take two questions. We have two microphones, if there are questions. So if there are questions, would you please go to the microphone and, and ask your question, and we'll ask uh, Her Excellency to, uh, to answer. Looks like we have a question coming down here. Thank you for your inspiring presentation today. Appreciate it very much. I've been reading, and I'm aware, I'm sure you are, that the uh, use of Internet have made us very interdependent around the world. And so how has the use of the Internet helped you in your country to educate your women and young girls. Thank you. Uh, that's a very difficult question for me because where I come from in my country, it's only 27 percent access for both men and women. Uh, and I've been advocating and I've been saying everywhere, if you are advancing at this fast pace in access to internet and the technology. You are leaving a whole generation behind. And it's a, t it's a time bomb. So another way of supporting us in Africa is to increase access. In other countries, they are doing better than others. But in my particular, in my country, it is 27%. Unfortunately, what I didn't say, one of the main challenges women leaders are facing is media coverage, negative media coverage, aimed at tarnishing women who we, we have seen that when they become members of parliament, they are better leaders. When they get into state house, they address social issues. But the same internet can go all the way to tarnish the image of these innocent women who have no capacity to fight back or 
to build a, a team, I'm told that you must have a, a quick response team to counter, but we don't know how to do it. So we just suffer in silence. But to, 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 to get straight to that question, there's need for us to increase access on the continent. Hi, Muli Wanji, President Mena, thanks so much for coming. Uh, I really like what you had to say about the fact that anybody who's committed to improving the disparities you talked about, uh, like health and education and other parts of the world, um, you know, anybody who's committed to that has a role to play in, in seeing that reality, not just powerful people. And I wanted to ask you about, um, highlight an opportunity that everybody in this room can take action on this week. And on February 2nd, the Global Partnership for Education Conference is, is meeting. All the countries in the world are getting together to decide how much money to give to this funding pool that will go directly towards projects on the ground, toward the Ministry of Education in countries like Malawi, not contractors, um, that will be focused explicitly on getting girls in school and other marginalized populations. Now, I'm part of a civil society group at K-State, which has some African student volunteers, and we've been working to get members of Congress to sign a resolution to the president urging him to adequately fund this. The United States, when, even though it has the, by far the biggest economy in the world, is not the biggest funder in the Global Partnership for Education. And it reflects our priority as a nation um, when it comes to getting girls in school in countries like Malawi. And we've been trying to get members of Congress to sign this resolution to President Trump, but if you can imagine, none of the members, this last time I checked, in Kansas of Congress have signed this resolution. Um, so clearly our work hasn't been enough, but maybe if everybody in this room, or everybody at K-State, could urge our government, or our elected officials, to encourage President Trump to adequately fund the Global Partnership for Education, maybe we could make that happen. And so my, my question is, what would you say to people right now who are inspired by your speech and wondering, what can I do, what opportunities do I have to join civil society's efforts to help countries like Malawi um, improve the indicators in health and education, and, and so on, like you talked about, thanks. Uh, I think at this moment in time, at individual level, there's so much that you can do. I just want to give an example. I, I, ca I cannot talk much about government position now. I can only talk what you as individuals can do. There's a gentleman who is a medical doctor based in Lancaster, ED, Dr. Nimai. Nimai is a medical doctor. We met in Malawi, and he asked me, just like you are, what is it that we can do? And I said, yo, I'm running schools, but m m my foundation targets girls that are coming from child-headed households where there are no parents. So the challenge is this girl child is torn between coming to school or sitting and looking for whatever she can find for her siblings. Usually those girls are 13, 14, looking af after four siblings. So he said to me, I will mobilize pre-cooked packs of food. In this pack, it's rice, bits of meat, and the vegetables. So when you put it in water, four minutes later, there's a meal. He mobilized one million packs and sent them to the Joyce Panda Foundation. And our attendance increased because this girl child now didn't need to stay away from school because we are the only th th one of three schools that are free in the country. So we struggle to make that run, but we have to do it because a secondary education is not free. But I decided I was going to make it happen. So we work together with Chris and my friend. So when she leaves school in the afternoon, this girl child, who is in a single uh, child-headed household, she gets a pack. When she gets home, it's in water, water and she has a meal for four, four children. That is, that sounds small here, because I've never seen a country with so much abundance of food that is wasted. I get into any restaurant, and all I see is food being thrown away, and I'm saying, wow. How do, I could feed 10 children with that. Every time they bring a meal to me, even today, the question is, are you sure you, want, you brought this to me so I can eat and finish it? Am I not bad enough already? But it, this is a country where even that could feed thousands of children and enable this girl child to go to school. The program that Alicia, this girl from New York State, has started, she asked me, I need to start work now. I, I said, yeah, at your age, since you are still going to school, school uniforms is the best. So she raised $5,000. And it's $10 
that can buy uniform to take a child to school. But I know that there are thousands and thousands of children in Malawi that don't go to school because they can't go to school in rags. But you can imagine what difference that would make. So my answer to that question would be to identify NGOs to partner with. That is what I said earlier. International NGOs sometimes come and sideline indigenous NGOs and think they can solve our problems and we watch them. Then 20 years later they say we are leaving, you people can't change. Yes, you can't change because you didn't target properly. You make a lot of difference if you work with the people on the ground. So my advice would be, right now we have formed what we're calling the Women Leaders Network. African Women Leaders Network, headquartered at the UN Women in New York. If you just ask them, my interest is food security, they'll give you an organization on the ground in any country in Africa that you can work with. I believe that the answer is private sector. Target the private sector when government is not doing it. I was able to build 20 holding shelters for women to get to the hospital, and the reason why I was angry, I went to a hospital and found the only baby born that night had died. What happened? Oh, we were delivering this baby in the dark. And I had walked 15 kilometers. But I needed to get it to bring a candle. So I didn't have the 50 cents to buy the candle. So we were delivering this baby in the dark. The cord had gone around the neck and we strangled the baby. Simple stuff. I just went to a private company and said, put electricity there. In one month, I was back to switch on electricity. So we can do it, but you can use the private sector. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for gracing us with your presence here. I think you can all tell if we just had a few uh, international leaders with this kind of courage and insight and thoughtfulness that we'd be a much better place. Uh, for it. So we, we're so pleased you're here. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you. Thank you.